Next, we have Alyssa Chott, who specializes in helping landowners in western Montana coexist with beavers by resolving conflicts using non-lethal methods. She is the program manager for the Beaver Conflict Resolution Project, a collaboration between Defenders of Wildlife, National Wildlife Federation, and Clark Fork Coalition. With a background in bear and uh, bear conflict mitigation, Elisa has worked with various landholders, both public and private, on how to coexist with wildlife for over nine years. She holds an MS in Environmental Studies from the University of Montana. Please welcome Alyssa to the stage. Thank you. So again, my name is Alyssa Chott, and I'm the program manager for the Beaver Conflict Resolution Project based in Missoula, Montana. Um, it's a collaboration between Defenders, Clark Fork Coalition, and National Wildlife Federation. And we started this project in 2019 as an experiment. Will these flow devices work in Western Montana? And the answer is yes. Four years later, we're a full-blown project, and it's been very successful. So I'm going to get into the um, why we made this project, the how, and then the what we do as a last bit. So beavers in Montana. They are managed by our state wildlife agency, um, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And so they have kind of three roles that they play. One, they're a fur bearer, so there's a trapping season on them. There's seasonal restrictions for dates, but there's no bag limits or mandatory reporting. Some areas are close to trapping, and whether that's for otter restoration or to protect um, past restoration efforts um, for beavers and or just to prevent beaver overharvest in those areas. Two, they're seen as a nuisance by some because they come and cut trees, they flood culverts, they flood roads, we all know what beavers can do with their activity. And then three, which is kind of a newer um, role that beavers play, are, is a restoration steward. And so the state is getting more on board with using beavers to restore headwaters and really provide great habitat for a myriad of other species. And so that's kind of where my program comes into with the non-lethal coexistence, um, kind of merging the restoration steward and the nuisance so that we can keep beavers in place. So, kind of got cut off, but that's okay. Um, so the background and development of the pilot project. So in 2014, the Montana Beaver Working Group was established and it's an informal network since 2020. It's been coordinated with the National Wildlife Federation out of our Missoula office, or their Missoula office. Um, in 2017, there was a beaver workshop that featured FWP, um, nonprofits and a variety of other stakeholders. And out of those conversations came the repeat of, well, beavers are great for ecosystems. However, how do we live with them? And so that's in why in 2018, there was a meeting to develop the position that I'm in right now. And so in May 2019, we launched the pilot project, which my background is in bears. I knew very little about beavers at the time, so it was a steep learning curve. Um, but it's been a lot of fun, beavers are great. And so um, in August 2019, FWP hosted a humans and bears meeting in Helena. And so that was a really great um, indicator that FWP was open for a wider conversation of having beavers on the landscape and using them for restoration purposes instead of just having them as fur bearers. How do we kind of make them have the best potential in those other roles that they play in as animals managed by the state. And so in February 2020, there's a beaver action plan meeting, again, with a huge number of stakeholders involved. And then we had an update meeting last March. So the working group activities covers a newsletter, and that just shares stories and projects that are going on with all these different groups and agencies around the state. There's webinars and workshops to highlight research and what people have been up to, and then field trips to actually go out and look at some of these projects that people have been doing. So these are the members. We're not gonna go through all of them. However, there's tribal representation, there's watershed groups, there's universities, there's nonprofits. Um, the Montana Trappers Association is part of it, um, federal and state agencies. So a really wide variety of stakeholders are involved in these co larger conversations about beavers in Montana. And so there's kind of four different categories that the working group covers, and it's goal number one is to integrate beaver into the design of restoration projects. Goal two is to expand beavers 
on public lands, especially in the headwaters. Goal three is where the conflict project falls into, and so that's non-lethal coexistence, providing education and outreach um, for landowners and other stakeholders. Goal four is to remove the legal and policy obstacles to beaver habitat restoration. Oh, I think I forgot to mention earlier. So beaver relocation in Montana can be done, but it's very difficult because you need a full environmental assessment of wherever you're moving the beavers to. You need a place to quarantine the beavers, which um, I'm not sure even really exists at this point. Um, and then there's the liability of if the beavers don't stay where you put them and they move and cause damage elsewhere, who is responsible for that? So relocation is possible, but it's just a very long, months-long process to get done in Montana. And so getting into our pilot project. So our project goals are to, one, build more tolerance and understanding for beavers on the landscape. Why are they important? And how can we keep them in place to provide these great ecosystem benefits that they do? And so that's through addressing nuisance concerns, con non-lethal conflict resolution, and outreach opportunities. Number two, reduce beaver conflicts. Again, just providing management alternatives other than trapping because trapping has been the only option on a widespread scale in Montana to deal with conflicts. And then three, train our partners to implement non-lethal methods. So again, it's a collaboration between Defenders, Clark Fort Coalition, and NWF. They offer funding and logistical support for my position, whether that's um, finding grants to keep me on every year from April to October, or providing vehicle usage, or finding volunteers. Um, they've been really, really great supporters and partners to work with. I completed Beaver Corps with Mike, so thank you for sharing your knowledge. Um, and our project helps with site design site assessment, device design, and permitting. In Montana, you either will need a 310 or a 124 for flow devices. We install it, and then we can cost share with landowners to help pay for materials. And so overall, we just want to keep beavers on the landscape where they're appropriate to create these tolerance corridors, because as beavers disperse, sometimes they're trapped out at one specific culvert because they keep damming it. It's the first great pinch point they get to, and so they can't make it from point A to point B. So can we put a culvert fence on there and move beavers across the landscape where they might have more open areas from public land to public land? So where are the beavers? Our pilot year, we didn't know. I talked to probably 80 or 90 people within the first two months, um, just contacting organizations and agencies and asking, hey, do you have beaver conflicts? And in 2020, our reports came through watershed groups, FWP, and other agencies. In 2021, word of the project got out, and the number of projects we were able to get done last year just skyrocketed. And so it was really great. We had, again, close cooperation with FWP, which I'll get into in a minute. And then in 2020, we're still growing. So these are the seven regions of um, FWP in Montana, um, and we're based out of region two there. That little green star is Missoula, that's home. And so generally about a two hour car ride is what I can manage to get to. And that's, we've found plenty of beaver conflicts within um, region two to address, and sometimes We've, we've had a couple projects over in Region 1, um, and so we're working on eventually expanding this out to other regions as well. And so this, first of all, I want to say a huge thank you to Tori Ritter with FWP. He deserves um, appreciation and recognition for his hard work and getting other people on board with our project. He's been a great internal cheerleader for that. and. He's actually created kind of a web and a funnel for conflicts to be reported to him, and then he sends it to our project. And so that's how we actually get connected with landowners, is through the state agency that's responsible for managing the beavers. And so private landowners contact him, but mostly it's the game wardens. And so they are the ones on the front line. They get the first calls of, hey, I have a beaver, what do I do? Or I have a beaver that's flooded my driveway can I trap it out? And so then the game wardens get in touch with Tori. He says, hey, this looks like a great opportunity for coexistence, and then I can go out and have those conversations. But this is kind of like 
the web of how conflicts get reported to us and to Tori. Um, our program has a cost share component to it, and I think that's been really, really important to our success along with that relationship with Tori and FWP. Um, because my time and travel is covered by our program, we only ask that landowners cover the cost of materials, and we can split that with them generally on a 50-50 basis. And so it makes coexistence far more affordable to people. We don't want coexistence, the financial burden, to be a barrier for people who want to live with beavers. Um, yet the landowner has skin in the game, and so they have a financial um, investment and incentive to upkeep their devices because we don't maintain them. We ask that the landowner do that once we're gone and the device is installed. Um, however, I do periodic updates just so that we know how these devices respond to, say, like Montana winters and runoff situations. So we've done 32 completed projects, eight hands-on workshops, 15 plus training opportunities. We've reached over 600 people in our four years um, through workshops and webinars and public events. I currently have about 12 projects on the roster right now. Um, in various stages, some of them are permitted, some of them need permits. Um, and for installing these, we ask that agencies and organizations and volunteers come and help us. And we've never not found enough people willing to put on a pair of waders and come out and get in a beaver pond with us. So this is kind of our spread. And sorry for the people in the back, this is kind of small. Um, it's also on an impact report that's on the defender's table, if you would like a copy of it. Um, but this is kind of our spread and reach by watershed. And so, uh, let's see if I can do this. So that's Missoula, home base there, but this is Anaconda area out here in Deer Lodge Valley. And so that's beaver hotspot for whatever reason. Um, there are a lot of conflicts out there. We've done a lot of projects in Anaconda area, but also up the Blackfoot and then up the Swan as well. Our projects by year, um, tree wrapping and exclusion fencing have been the two most common projects and concerns that we get from landowners. However, last year we did four pond levelers when in 2020 we didn't get any request for pond levelers. But again, project just took off last year. In 2019 we had eight projects, in 2020 there were six, and we did 17 last year. And so far in 2022 we've completed two um, like I said, I have about 12 that are in various stages of getting done. And this slide has a lot of numbers, but I really want to focus on kind of the change in installations. Um, because we thought that we would have a lot of private landowners wanting to coexist with beavers, and that wasn't the case for our first two years. And so down there at the bottom, six out of eight of our first installs that year were on public land and then five out of six our second year. But last year, that just flip-flopped. And so 15 out of 17 of our projects were on private land last year. And then so far in this season, we've had 21 reported conflicts in 2022. And then um, last year, for all seven months of our project, we had 29 reported conflicts. And so we've already hit like a record number of reported conflicts by this time. And there seems to be a cluster. We get those dispersers, and so we get a lot of conflict calls in the spring, and then in the fall, when all the beavers are busy making everything robust for winter, we get an uptick in, um, in fall as well for reported conflicts. So training partner organizations is key in this to getting more of these devices out on the landscape, more people interested, more watershed groups talking to their own landowners that they work with. And so um, FWP, nonprofits, Montana Rail Link, we did a project with them last year, um, county roads crews, the state road crews, forest service, conservation districts. Conservation districts are also the ones who issue the permits that we need to do these devices. And if the lady in red looks familiar, it's because she's, <laughs> it's Elisa. <laughs> and so she came out and helped us um, with a three-day workshop at, at Lost Creek State Park, which I have more photos of that later on. So here are our strategies. I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because I think for the most part we're familiar with the different kinds of conflicts and how to solve them. But tree cutting, culvert plugging, and freestanding dam flooding, how do we solve those? We wrap trees with sturdy wire so that it stands up away from the um, tree. Uh, I use 
four foot fencing pretty much exclusively in Montana. A couple times we've gotten away with three feet, but we have a lot of snow. So four feet is what I usually like to use. Uh, culvert plugging, exclusion fences for that, or if you have a small space, put a pipe through it so that the beavers can dam on the fence, but you still have that water flow. And then freestanding dam flooding, of course, on flubblers. And this next group of slides is kind of an FAQ that I've acquired um, from conversations with landowners over the years of their number one concerns and worries, and then how do we address that so that they have a bigger picture of why beavers are important and don't, and kind of shift that attitude of, well, they're just a pesky rodent, but why should we have them on our property? And so the first comment that I get often is that if they did this one dam overnight, what are they gonna do in a week or a month? And so beaver activity is not exponential, I always tell people. And then notching dams, for whatever reason, people just can't help it, but they have to notch the dams. It just keeps the beavers busy, right? They, landowners are worried about losing their trees, but they remove the dams, and so then beavers cut down more trees to replace those dams, and so it just keeps the beavers busy and makes this negative feedback loop for the landowner. And continual removal of dams at Culver Inlets just teaches them to build inside where they're harder to reach. We have found that out on multiple occasions as well. Um, and juvenile beavers build weird dams in weird places. And so sometimes if you can stop and wait until after runoff, they might not even be there. And so that outreach early in the season is important for getting people um, to kind of think about beavers differently instead of, well, he's here to stay, he might not be. And then trapping is still a necessary management tool in certain cases. This isn't an animal welfare project. Um, we are trying to have more beavers on the landscape where they're appropriate. If a beaver sets up shop in the middle of a hay field, the habitat benefits there are gonna be minimal. And so where can we have um, great beaver benefits and still have that um, pretty minimal conflict with humans? And so this isn't an animal welfare project. We still recognize that trapping um, still might need to happen in some cases because so not every landowner is going to have different goals, right? And so some landowners don't mind if they have six ponds. Some landowners just want one pond. And so beavers don't generally build one pond. And so depending on the landowner's goals um, and what the beavers need to survive, sometimes those don't always match up. But coexistence can happen if landowner's goals, what the beavers need to survive, and then what the devices and the sites um, considerations can do. If those all merge, then we can have great successful coexistence projects. I'm going to go through some of our installations. So this is um, some tree wrapping that we've done, and we've our very first project was um, that bottom left corner. That was on a golf course. We've done fishing access sites with uh, FWP. We've done ranching leases on state lands with private ranchers, uh, city parks, nonprofits. This is a, an exclusion fence that we did out on a wildlife management area with FWP. And that over there on the right is the former beaver device. And it's just a vertical culvert with slats cut through it. And so it did a great job at keeping the beavers from damming and plugging the culvert. However, it cut down on the culvert capacity. So it essentially acted kind of like a beaver dam. And so we took that out and then put a fence on it instead to open up the capacity of the culvert so that the road wouldn't stop flooding. This is a the biggest fence we've ever built. It's 10 feet by 22 feet. And it was to encompass a seven foot culvert and a three foot culvert. And this um, is kind of, a, kind of a funky, you'll notice that um, far corner over there is a little low, that was a hole, and the water fluctuates pretty um, drastically during runoff because there's backwater from the main river channel. This is another culvert fence that we did with uh, Forest Service, actually, and this has an experimental open corner there. So that's a little 18-inch channel and highway for the beavers to get in and out and um, move through the culvert. However, the hope is that those two hard 90 degrees are going to be enough that they don't bring in the big sticks with them. So far, that's working well. 
the thing with this site is I thought we had built this high enough for runoff. However, runoff came and overtopped the fence. And so it was one of our lessons we learned that that fence is now, I think, six and a half feet tall. Um, we just added more fencing on top of it a couple weeks ago. But just prepare for rain events and, you know, the flashier streams that we have in Montana. This is a, an irrigation ditch out in Deer Lodge Valley. Um, and the irrigators had removed these two big piles over the course of two years. That's the dammed head gate. The beavers did a pretty good job of restricting flow there um, and aiming for that pinch point as they do. And so we took that off, put an exclusion fence on it, and it's been working beautifully ever since. Saves the irrigator a lot of work coming and unplugging it every morning. This is a pond leveler we did with uh, Montana Rail Link last year, the water had backed up far enough upstream that it was affecting a bridge as well as the water table was high enough and it's um, pretty gravelly substrate there. So the water table was actually affecting a nearby railroad tunnel and causing some mud to form in it. And so we dropped the water quite a bit. Um, it's one of those things that we'll see how the beavers react as time goes on because it was a little farther than um, what Mike usually recommends, but <laughs> this is one of my beaver core projects that um, Mike helped me with. And so this is what Elisa came out and helped us with. This was day one of our three day um, workshop with Beavers Northwest, um, fence and pipe device at Lost Creek State Park outside of Anaconda. And this is probably one of my favorite devices that we've done. Um, it was a little tiny pond not very wide, an 18 inch culvert. And so we knew the beavers, we couldn't build a fence big enough to keep the beavers out away enough from that flow. And so we made it tiny, tiny, let them dam on it and put a pipe through it preemptively so that the water would still make it to the culvert and not flood the road. So this is a pond leveler that we installed. Um, again, this was with Beavers Northwest and part of the three day workshop. And so I wanna go over some lessons that we've learned when we've developed this pilot project and how it's evolved over the years, but permitting timelines can be challenging. So damage permits from FWP can be issued within a day or two, maybe a week. And so that's drastically different from the permitting process that people need for a flow device because that takes anywhere from about a week and a half to over a month. And so the beavers never get the memo that you're trying to help. They're out there building, 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 and so um, that's been a challenge. We did have one site early on that the beavers got trapped out uh, because it just, the permitting timeline was taking too long and they were causing flooding um, that we couldn't deal with. Um, consulting fish biologists at the beginning of projects is really useful just to make sure there's no species of concern in the stream system, have those conversations up front because they're on the permitting committee for those permits we need. Um, build culvert fences taller for runoff. We found that out this year. Um, reinforce intake fences for ice buildup. We just pound in four T-posts in the circular intake fences now. And educational signs are useful so people know how devices work and know that not all beaver dams are bad because this is our Lost Creek State Park device and some helpful resident <laughs> and visitor spent I don't know how long taking off the beaver dam around our culvert fence. The, so the beavers went in through the culvert, plugged it up. We got that unplugged, took that material, put it back around the fence to give them the idea to dam back there. And they did um, where we wanted them to. And so it's been working great ever since. It now has a sign explaining how the device works and please don't touch the beaver dam. <laughs> and finally, um, just expect the unexpected. I know when all of you guys registered, the one burning question on your mind is, if a beaver falls out of a tree and no one is around to hear it, does it still make a splash? Beavers don't climb trees, you say. Well, I found one that does because that's about 10 feet above the water line. So he scooted his little way up. Um, that's a pretty sloped tree, but I imagine he made a pretty good splash once he fell because that's not much chewing and that branch that he was on wasn't very big, but. Just be willing to adapt, and beavers are surprising. Uh, so ultimately, uh, we wanna have beavers coexistence to promote healthy watersheds. So the overarching goals of our project is uh, we have more beavers, we have healthier, resilient watersheds. 
conflict resolution resources are vital to make that happen. And the social and educational aspects of my job and this position is really important as well. Forging those really tight connections and building that trust with landowners is important for lasting success and just your rapport as well within communities that I'm not just a nonprofit coming in and pushing my agenda on to somebody else. We're working with them, finding out what they need, um, what they're comfortable with as far as beaver activity and um, just teaching them why beavers are important and how they work. And we're wanting to replicate my position in other areas of Montana, just I'm one person. And so that region two blue splotch you saw on the map, um, while that is a big area, there are beavers in other places. And so one of these days, we're hoping to expand and have other beaver techs in other places to work and do this kind of um, non-lethal coexistence so that we can have more beavers in other areas as well. So I wanna say thank you again to our partners and if anybody wants to be included on the Montana Beaver Working Group, you can contact Shelby down there at the bottom, she can add you on, but thank you so much. We have time for one question actually, who would like to be the lucky one? That's great, thank you. Um, I've been admiring your project from afar. Oh, thanks. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more to long-term maintenance plans for these devices. For example, the example you shared where suddenly something unexpected happened, you have damming back in the culvert, and how that differs between the public land that you've been working on and the private land owners, um, especially for like staff turnover at public land agencies and such. I'm, I'm kind of curious what, what your thinking is around that as you scale this up. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's something that I'm sure will continue to evolve as well. I've developed kind of maintenance handouts that I give to landowners and I do hear from them and they tell me what the beefs are up to. And so if there is an unexpected happening, like if somebody comes and takes off a beaver dam and all of a sudden they're in the culvert, we come back and help fix that too and help problem solve um, because you know we're still figuring it out. We want these devices to work and again, have that rapport and build up of successful projects instead of, well, we built this thing and now we're not gonna touch it again. So definitely keeping in contact with people and as far as turnover goes, um, with the state agency, since it's FWP specifically for that project with the culvert issue, um, they're the state man management agency and so they're kind of, that's their job. <laughs> and so it's kind of easy to work with them because they're willing to adapt and you know, deal with the surprises that pop up, but also, you know, they they need to have a working park road and also, you know, mitigate conflicts and resolve conflicts long-term. Thank you so much, Alyssa. 